Welcome to Season 3 of the M-W Tactical Podcast. Sit back and enjoy the conversations of the mad scientist and myself as we discuss the sport of shooting, goals, training, and everyday life. You are listening to the M-W Tactical Podcast. All right, good people. We're back at it again. Another installation of the M-W Tactical Podcast. And this week, we have a special guest with us. But before we do anything, I do want to say the sponsor for this week's show is CAE Transfers. They're a transfer company out of Columbia, South Carolina, and they have the cheapest prices in the state when it comes to firearm transfers. So please go look up CAE Transfers. And if you're in the Columbia, South Carolina area or visiting the area and you need a transfer, look up and hit up CAE Transfers for all your transfer needs. Um, moving forward, I do want to thank everyone who listens to the show in the States and abroad. It is very much welcome and appreciated. And for those of you who live abroad and listen, please contact us and we would like to bring you on to the show. So email us, DM, send a message on Facebook, send us your phone number overseas and we will contact you and we will make that happen. Also remember 30 April through 2 May, the South Carolina section is taking place and registration is open now. And to let everyone know, the mad scientist is looking for everyone who listens to this podcast to come out to Belton, South Carolina and shake his hand. Yes, so, come out there. Yeah. So without further ado, I want to go ahead and bring in the co-hostess with the mostest, my man with the plan, the dude who does everything on the technical aspect when it comes to firearms, the mad scientist himself, Dave. What's going on, Dave? What's going on, Mike? Not too much. And um, actually bringing in another special co-host for the show i have the one the only the little assistant herself little emma how's it going for you emma good. You, good? Yeah. Yeah. you said you want to do the podcast with me so you're doing the podcast okay. yeah so we get to talk a little Excellent. bit about firearms and um the safety aspect of it and just have fun right yeah all right so here we go hi all emma right. good to see you <laughs> all right so um how, how was your week dave uh it's pretty good uh i got busy um kind of end of the week we had an emergency project come through um which is good but it was just a bit unexpected and required a lot of uh attention a lot of a lot of time um on the computer programming stuff but got it done we got the Got the work accomplished. Hopefully, um, we'll make the customers happy. And I'm going to take a break tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounded like it was something that had you on the go um, pretty much all day. So, um, and of course, going through the weekend. But yeah, as I've always said, busy is good when it comes to work. It is good. It was just uh, quite unexpected and immediate. Uh, but yeah. It was good. Turned out good. Hopefully, um, something good will come of it, and we'll we'll get some good business out of it. Hey, that's what it is, right there. So, pushing forward. This is week number two. She actually is back in the seat again. This time, there are no straps in the seat holding her in place. She <laughs> came at her own free will. She said she is ready to tackle this. I have my own opinion that says, I don't know, but she is still with us, giving us the female perspective when she does speak, the one and only Coach B. What's going on, B? Hi, Michael. Hi, Dave. Hi, Emma. Hi. <laughs> we need your input. We yes, we <laughs> need the female perspective, and you are the probably the only one brave enough female-wise to come on to the show and have the conversation with us so how, how has your week glad been you're there, back coach b <laughs> it's been good um a little busy mw tactical definitely keeps me but busy so that's where i'm at 
No, I got it. I got it. Um, has anything popped up on the radar that interests you um, far as in the relation of going on in the gun industry or anything political as far as the revolving around firearms that caught your ear, caught your eye? No, just looking forward to getting out, shooting some matches because I haven't shot in several weeks. So I'm just waiting for that. Yeah, it's, it's hard to do. We've we've come from the last few years of, of shooting a match every weekend right. to where we are right now, kind of worried about what matches we can shoot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so one thing um, I was I have been doing since I cut back on doing like a lot of local matches. I caught myself thinking more about projects I want to do. And mm -hmm. one project I want to do is I want to build stuff around the house and remodel a lot of stuff around the house. So one project I do particularly want to step in on is the remodeling of my closet in my bedroom. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I like got you buy a house and it only has those wire hangers, um, shelves in yeah. the closet. So I want to take that out and I want to build cupboards and I want to put like a little section for my suits, a little section for my um, hang up shirts, my button down shirts. You have suits? Yeah, man. I, I got a few of them. <laughs> you know, Very I, nice. I like that song by ZZ Top. You know, they say every woman's crazy about her sharp dress, man. Yeah. <laughs> I have so, a suit, but I don't think I can fit into it anymore. <laughs> oh, man. So when I went over to Korea, that was my second duty station. When I left Korea, I ended up getting a couple custom made suits over there. Oh, and, cool. Yeah. And I had like 18 of them. Be able to bring them back? Yeah. I, I bought them all back. Yeah. So um, I left them. Uh, well, I was mailing them back to the States to my, my buddy who lived in Colorado. So we was real close at my first duty station. We was on the same basketball team and all 18 suits was ready for me to come back to the States, go pick them up. His house burned down. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> so um oh, gosh. I, I was upset about that, but it wasn't nothing I could really do about it. You know, I was just glad to know that and you know, um uh, my man John and his family were safe and you know still yeah. functional and yeah. everything. So I went on ahead and started rebuilding my wardrobe, my suit wardrobe. And at this point in time, up until because I stopped buying my, I bought my last suit maybe three years ago. And um, I ended up getting like 13 of them. Like that was my last count. But that was over the course of years. Yeah. So you got to remember my weight fluctuated a lot because, you know, doing like the cage fighting, um, the constant working out, the times I wasn't working out. So my weights were always up and down. So some suits are bigger, look look like my dad's suits. <laughs> Other suits look like they might fit me. And so yeah, when, when I was all doing all range. that, I I could not consume enough calories to to increase weight at all. I was burning so many calories when I was doing the martial arts stuff. Right. Now things are a bit different. <laughs> but, you know, um, Coach B has her own form of um, martial arts that she be doing. You know, um, what your martial arts is walking down the aisles of certain what um clothing stores what? <laughs> what are you talking about <laughs> like your martial arts isn't that your martial arts you got the keen eye for a sale <laughs> <laughs> that's my cardio shopping that's it oh i've i've been shopping with my wife a couple times and it is definitely cardio oh, wow. yeah. so, <laughs> michael always tells me <laughs> If you want me to walk with me, you got to slow down. Yeah, you know, I, I can't walk fast anyway. So that's one thing I do like about when we be out there shooting and when we be walking to one stage to the next stage, everybody walks slow because they're pulling their cart. Mm -hmm. And um, naturally, I can't walk fast because one explosion that I was in, it kind of uh, messed up my back a little bit. And when it messed up my back, it affected my hips. So I got to take shorter steps to be in that comfortable range. I can't take the long strides. So, and one day we was walking, <laughs> she was just running from me and then she said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I was like, no, nah, you're good. You're good. Said, if you need to get there, go ahead. I'll catch up. I know where you're going. <laughs> so 
I don't I just don't see a reason to, to do it anymore since I'm more comfortable with you know taking my time when I'm walking. Yeah. What do you do for cardio? We got a race going on, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, we're supposed to be doing a race and um what race are you doing? Yeah, you're gonna lose. It's the she calling it the guys versus the girls. Okay. You know what, what are you saying? racing? So, who are you racing? Who's gonna be in the race? Daddy and Bryson. Okay. So you remember Bryson who used to shoot last year? Yeah, I remember him. We got him some sights on his uh yeah. on his gun. Yeah, so it's supposed to be me and Bryson against the little assistant and Coach B. So, what race is like a foot race? What yeah, a foot race. Yeah. Yeah. Because she says she's super fast. So I was like, okay, let's find out. So Emma, you're super fast. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> How fast do you run? Um, so fast. You run like so the fast? flash. Oh wow. Well, well, okay. See. I'm not really like flash. Not, not quite that fast. fast? Well, I'm fast, but not like flash. No, yeah. Okay. He kind of cheats though. Yeah, he does. But, he has superpowers. It's yeah. Not fair. No, it's not fair. I agree. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> All right. So um hey, let's let's take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, let's hit up these main topics. And then this week's interview, we're gonna talk about something, and it's pretty funny how it kind of went down. And you know, the mad scientists got called out. So everybody, please stay in your seats and here are a few words from our sponsors. Hey, this is Brian Conley at Hunter's HD Gold. If you've never tried Hunter's HD Gold, then I challenge you to find me at a match next year. Go to the website under scheduled events, find out where I'm going to be. Come meet me in person and demo a pair for yourself. Find out why shooters across the United States are changing to Hunter's HD Gold to get 43% more light to their eyes, better contrast, eyes that are not fatigued at the end of the day based on the, the colors that we use, and find out the real meaning of why they change so you don't have to. So check us out on our website, huntershdgold.com, and I look forward to seeing you at the range soon. JM4 Tactical has developed a state-of-the-art polymer holster that will quickly become your go-to holster. With high quality Hermit Oak leather, securely sewn to the interior of the molded outer Bolteron shell, your draw becomes silent and no more scratches up and down your firearm. When seconds count, you can rest assured that you will have the upper hand when you need it most. Whether you carry open or concealed, the Relic Holster is available in four different models fitting over hundreds of different style guns. The new reliable, easy, light, individual carry holster by JM4 Tactical. Order your relic today at jm4tactical.com. What's up, good people? This is Michael Woodland from M-W Tactical. This is Coach B from M-W Tactical. And we are asking for your help with two GoFundMe campaigns that we have started. The first one is we are making a professional movie and it's gonna be about our day-to-day -day life within the sport of shooting. Details about this campaign can be found by visiting gofundme.com forward slash we are making a professional movie. The second campaign, we are asking for you to donate to give financial assistance for those who cannot financially get the training they deserve. Remember, there are a lot of first time gun owners out there and I am asking for everyone in the gun industry to come together and make our community stronger. For more details, visit gofundme.com forward slash free firearms training. Remember how important training is to keep everyone informed and safe. All right, good people. We're back at it again. And thank you for coming back for round two of the M-W Tactical Podcast. Um, this week, uh, we have an interview, and that's going to come in the third segment of the show. And the person who we're interviewing this week is J.J. Ricaza. And of course, we know J.J. actually put out a few challenge drills for everyone. And the mad scientist was doing these drills and he actually ended up catching JJ in one of them. <laughs> so during the interview, you're going to hear me talk to JJ about it in a sense. 
And he comes back and says he's going to throw a challenge out to the mad scientist solely for the mad scientist. Okay. <laughs> We're going to see right. how this is going to turn out. <laughs> see what he's got with his 1980s Beretta uh -oh. 92. Here we go. The challenge has been made. Accept it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what, what do you think about this challenge there coach b i think it's gonna be interesting yeah i, I think so too. I can't wait i think so too i don't know what he's got man we'll yeah. see it'll be fun yeah i think it will be also so we we had a great conversation so um please everybody just stay tuned for um the interview that's coming after the next commercial break but before we even get that far into it uh what matches are you planning on shooting for this shooting season so i just i started looking over the last couple of weeks trying to get matches planned and i've got the um of course we got the south carolina section match which i'm i'm actually directing but um shooting that match and uh i'm gonna miss the carolina classic this year because it is falling on the same weekend as the area five championship I tried to shoot the Area 5 championship last year, but because of the the crazy COVID schedule, things got postponed and moved around, so I didn't get to shoot it. So I really want to do that this year. So I'll miss the Carolina Classic, which is always one of my favorite matches to shoot, and I really feel bad about missing it. But I've been trying to shoot the Area 5 now for two years. I'm going to try to make it happen this year. Um, now, is the Area 5, that's not the... I mean, um, the Carolina Classic, is that the North Carolina or is that? Area? Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's North Carolina a, match. North Carolina match, yeah. Okay. And it's always, I love the match. It's always one of my favorite matches to shoot throughout the year. And I, I hate that I'm missing it, but it's just the way it's going to happen this year. Yeah, I had a bad experience at that one, but it, it was mainly my fault. Um, oh, that was a DQ, wasn't it? It was a DQ. But Last year. The yeah. match... I was doing so good on that first stage and I was like, man, and I felt like I got a little overconfident. And then when I got to the stage that DQ me, I was like, oh, I'm gonna show everybody what I got. <laughs> <laughs> Came out that holster and, you know, 10 feet in front of me, round shot, went off. So I'm like, shot a hole in the holster. <laughs> yeah, not the holster, but <laughs> it was somewhere oh in the dirt. <laughs> it was in the video. So it happened. So, but uh, I'm, I'm planning on shooting the I don't know what they call it. Georgia State. Is it the Georgia State Steel Challenge? That that Steel Challenge match everybody's putting on. Okay, yeah, that's the one. Uh, Jamie is doing. Down yeah, Jamie. There, um... You had on the we had on the podcast uh, a few weeks ago. Right. So I'm planning on um, going down there shooting that in March. I haven't shot Steel Challenge much at all, but I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot a few steel local Steel Challenge matches up coming up to that just to get a little more practice in. Um, and then we've got the Area 6 Championship in April, second weekend in April. I'm going to shoot that. And then uh, last weekend in April, first weekend in, in uh, uh, May is South Carolina section match. Um, that's what I'm looking at there. And then I want to pick up a couple local matches at uh, Pine Tucky Gun Club mm -hmm. and um, Mid-Carolina Gun Club. Um, those are the two local matches I'm going to try to focus on this year. Um, we've got Area 5. Where's Area 5's coming up in September. It's the second weekend in September, which happens to be the same weekend as the Carolina Classic. Um, if you guys um, want to shoot a level two match, uh, there is not – a better match that I've ever been to than the Carolina Classic. You guys make sure you get out there. It's not far away from the Southeast if you're in the area. Um, it's the second weekend in September. I'm going to shoot the Area 5 uh, Championship, which is also going to be a fun match, level three match. October, the National Championship is coming up again. Um, looks like one, two, three, fourth weekend in October is the high cap, uh, national championship. Hopefully we make it through all that and, um, uh, maybe we can pick up another one or two in November and December, but, um, okay. I'm, I'm planning on working on, uh, GM classification near this year. Um, I didn't really do much 
to work toward that last year. I was just focused on, uh, you know, match performance and, and, and a lot of movement stuff is what I was focused on last year. Right. So I'm going to try to shoot some more classifiers and um, see if I can't make it there this time. Well, for this year, I've already set it in my mind that I'm going to do nationals area six and the South Carolina state match, the sectional um, that we're planning. Um, another one that I was really looking for, I really enjoyed it last year in 2020 was the Georgia state match. I really did that enjoy fun. that one. That was a fun one. Yeah. And it was the way it flowed. It was like, they really put the time in and it, the dedication they did, it was smooth operations. So mm -hmm. I really enjoyed that match. And then area five was the one we were supposed to shoot. And then once the COVID pandemic hit the haywire, it was everywhere. Yeah. And yeah. There was so much confusion going on with that. I'm sitting back like, okay, did I pay for this? Did I not pay for this? Or do I owe somebody money for this? What's going on here? So, um, but area five, I do want to go ahead and tackle that one also. So as of right now, I am looking at five matches, major matches for this year. Last, in 2020, I did seven. Yeah. So I said I wanted to do between five and six this year. Yeah, I shot a lot last year. Even with all the craziness going on, I still I still made a lot of major matches. But right. this year I'm trying to hopefully – can make plans and, and the plans stick. Yeah. They, they... <laughs> now here's one of my plans that I plan on doing because the goal is ultimately to make master. But as of right now, the short-term goal is to make a class. My plan is of course, stick with dry fire. I'm hitting the gym. I'm working out <clears throat> at the same time. I want to work more on movement, as you stated, what you worked on last year. Mm -hmm. The other side of it is I'm going to pull back from doing stage designs and doing all the setup and just focus more on me and shooting for 2021. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so much. We get so involved with, with so many aspects of the sport. Correct. Sometimes you do have to kind of step back and you know, let somebody else take that stuff on and to, yeah. to progress yourself, you really have to focus on, on yourself and what you're doing. And I do have to give credit to coach B because she was the one that actually pointed that out to me. And the thing she was saying, she's been saying it ever since the beginning of the summer of 2020 and might've been before that, but this is when it really set in on me because she was more like, you got too much on your plate. You know, so you're, you're thinking of all these ideas of what you want to do. You're doing the podcast. You're on however many shows, like every week, <laughs> you know, you're doing stage designs. You're helping everybody out in the clubs of setting up the matches. But yet you're still getting your practice in. But if you wasn't doing all that extra, you can contribute more to yourself. How much better mm -hmm. would it be? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And ever since she said that, it's been playing on my mind and I think for this season, I'm going to incorporate more of what she observed and try to put it back more in myself. So the outcome is more of a reward for me. Well, that's why she's the coach. Yeah. Like I said, she, she'd be observing some stuff and I'd be like, hold on. You was paying attention to that? <laughs> What's going on here? Emma, so, what matches are you shooting this year? You going to shoot a steel challenge match with your dad? None. None? <laughs> Oh man, they were so much fun. Yeah. Well, we we made a deal that um, she won't be able to start shooting for another two years, three years. Okay. So she'll be seven in August. So two years, you know. But okay. yeah, it's 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 the deal we made. So we're gonna go ahead and honor that. But yeah. until then, she does. We are working with her on the safety rules. Mm -hmm. We're doing the safety rules and hard. So she had those at one point in time because when she was an infant, I used to take her to work with me and we didn't have a classroom because I was working at the marksmanship unit, the army marksmanship unit. 
And a lot of our class instructions was on the range, but we wasn't shooting. So of course, if you're in the military, you know you can't just bring civilians to the range when you have live rounds. You gotta go through a process to you know, get that through. So of course, whenever I would take her to the range with me, it would only be instruction. Like we have a dry race board out there and yeah. we'll sit out there and teach the class. And I believe she was actually paying attention to a lot of that stuff. Because if you go back to an earlier Facebook video that I put up, I straight up asked her in the video what was wrong with him shooting. And she was like, it was his foot. It was his stance. Or whatever <laughs> she said in the video. That's she great. She was gurgling it out. And of course, like when I took her to work, I would be playing around with her and I'd be like, what did they do wrong? And then she'll either point to their hands or point to their feet. This was like roughly when she first started talking. And I was like, oh, wow, that's that's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> you know, so the, yeah. So it's like the, I said, she was observing it. But oh, it's great. Yeah, my she, son will do the same thing. He'll 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 point out stuff that adults. Yeah. Full grown adults are doing wrong. He'll point that out. <laughs> but I, I think the thing with her is through the instruction portion. When we're teaching the soldiers how to stand, how to hold the firearm, what to do when they're shooting, she was paying so much attention to that, that there's no other distractions for her because she doesn't know any better. She paid more attention to it, you know? So of course, when you say something to her, what did, what did he do wrong? She can point out the little nuisances that, or nuances that will, you know, have the shot malfunction you know, but when you try to explain that to people, they was more like, what, 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 you taking a child to the range? Okay, when I say the range, I'm telling you the location oh, where it's... we was at. There's no live rounds going off there <laughs> and everything like that. And for the longest, I was sitting there like, why are people tripping out about this? Because, <laughs> you know, I terminology know. in the military and the civilian side was two different terminologies. So my son has better gun handling skills and, and knowledge of, of gun safety than a, than a lot of adults that I've encountered at the range. Oh, yeah. But I'm a firm believer in if you were to start with your children at a young age, they don't have no bad habits. So it isn't like they're, they tried to figure it out on their own and come in to let me do it the right way. You already started them right because when – when I was stationed at Fort Benning and I was around my daughter every day, I was just playing around, like, you know, saying the four firearm safety rules for, and I had them like hung up on the wall and she would literally point to the one, whatever one I'm talking about. And yeah, remember she can't read at this time, <laughs> you know? So <laughs> when I'm saying rule number one is, you know, treat every firearm as if it's loaded. So Emma, do you son, remember the rules now? I don't think she clearly remembers them. What, like if I do, you know one, what, what are they? See. Tell me which rule is this one, okay? Never put your finger on the trigger until you have your sights on the target and you made the conscious decision that you're ready to shoot the target. Okay, you never touch the gun. <laughs> but what rule is that that I just described? Yeah, so see, she she clearly doesn't remember. She knows, the she, yeah, knows she, she knows them. She knows them. But the thing is, the way we was, like, for instance, I can ask you, like, okay, tell me the four rules. She can actually say that back in the day. You know, like, the four yeah. rules. It'll be choppy, but you can put it together what she's trying to say. But if there's been an absence of communication when it comes to, you know, safety rules and everything. So, But she'll she'll get it back. But I'm a firm believer in once we start going to the range, she's going to be better at the age of 14 than I was at the age of 37. Well, excellent. Emma, let me know when you're ready to go to the range and shoot a steel challenge match. I've got a couple guns I set up for my son when he was about your age and they're super easy to shoot. Uh oh. And, uh, you know, the steel challenge stuff is really fun. You don't have to run around or do reloads or anything. You just, just shoot steel plates as fast as you can it's so much fun got some guns ready for you when you're ready 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's it right there. So, Coach B, when was the first time you remember touching and firing a handgun or a rifle? I want to say I was around four. Mm. I grew up with boys. Um, I would say I was probably my dad's boy, even though I was one of five kids. Um, I was the only girl. Mm -hmm. So I was treated just like the boys. So I would say I was probably about four. We would go squirrel hunting and then we would go to turkey shoots and shoot the 410. So that was my. Can you explain to me how a turkey shoot works? I've seen signs on the side of the road, like in spray paint <laughs> all over the place for turkey shoots. I don't know what that is. Right, right, look, before you answer that, because I don't know either, <laughs> but my impression of a turkey shoot is if you come and shoot you're going to walk away with the turkey that's what i've always looked at it because like what heard, kind of turkey like yeah, a, like everybody who talked about it it was like like a frozen a turkey, turkey from the grocery like, store or something yeah it was like i left with a turkey so i think that's turkey. what it is yes yeah, it's, it's a real turkey but it's frozen <laughs> you know okay well, you i know, have no it's, idea it's not just turkey or at least the one we went to um so you would shoot I think either the 410 or the 22 and it's just like whenever you go to the indoor range where they have it you know on the line mm -hmm. and they t run it out however just whatever the target is. Mm -hmm. yeah. um and then each competitor shot you can hold on to your target and at the end whoever has the best score they win whatever item and it can be like pretty much turkey um a ham, bacon. I mean, it's different items. Oh, it's meat though. It's just meat. You're just winning meat. I don't That's know. cool. How do you how do you score with a shotgun? Well, I guess it's the how many um because of the pellets. Because you're using like birdshot, I think is what it was. So however many pellets was on the target and who got closest to the bullseye. Okay. Does that make yeah. okay? Yeah, so what if you don't you have win a the choke? meat? Yeah, you don't have a choke <laughs> on it, then you automatically, you know, I'm in the runnings, but I'm at the bottom. I <laughs> I'm going to win some meat. I'm going to start going to turkey shoots. Meat's go. expensive, man. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's how we ate sometimes. <laughs> we would all go. It was, my mom would shoot, my dad, and then my brother, you know. One or two of them would shoot. So that's and then you're would. literally bringing home the bacon. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I did you there? Remember, <laughs> you remember your first experience with a shotgun? My first experience? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I used to shoot uh, clays in, in the backyard at my mom and dad's house. Um, mm. We would just throw clays out like manually out over the garden where my, right. my dad he still has a garden now he grows his own you know vegetables and stuff and uh we would just throw clays out there and i we just shoot clays in the backyard at i don't know i was like eight or nine years old probably i got this mark right here on my thumb right there yeah um i don't know if you can see it on the camera or not but there's a mark like right there on my thumb no oh, that's not a mark what is that yeah so this this right here is from <laughs> All right, so if you're listening to the podcast, if you go to YouTube and check out the podcast, you'll see the mark that I'm pointing. I don't see thumb. it. Don't you can't see it. Yeah, it's a little. <laughs> see that little mark right there? No, I don't see it. right there. It's about half an inch long. Yeah, it's, it's not big at all. But that was from my first experience shooting a shotgun, and we was at my uncle's house in North Carolina. So it was me, my dad, um, a couple cousins, and. When I picked up the shotgun, because, you know, they was like, hey, whatever you want to shoot, just pick a gun off the table. And it, it was literally like 200 guns on the table. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was a whole lot of them. <laughs> so, did, what, was, what made you pick the shotgun? Um, all the handguns I have shot over the years. And the one I didn't like was the, the little Walther one, like James Bond carry. Yeah, that was the P one I PPQ didn't like. or yeah, something it, like that. Yeah, it was like it was really small, and that was the reason why I didn't like it because my hands it didn't complement my hands like yeah. the other guns did. Small guns are hard to shoot. Yeah, so 
I heard my dad kept talking about the shotgun. So I was like, I'm going to show my dad I know how to shoot this thing. <laughs> so when I shot it, and everybody kept telling, like yelling at me, like, put it in your shoulder, put it in your shoulder. I was like, no, I got this. Once again, as a kid, I'm referencing the movies and you know, like how when you see them shoot the shotgun, how they almost make in a circle motion, they'll shoot it and they'll bring it around and keep shooting it like that. So I was like, I got this. I'm, I'm gonna show my dad a thing or two. Man, that thing went off, cut my hand, hit me in my hip. <laughs> <laughs> Almost knocked me down. <laughs> I wanted to cry, but I, I couldn't cry in front of my dad. <laughs> like, oh my goodness, man, what's really going on here? <laughs> so, um, the next time I did it, you know, I was listening to my uncle, and he was from a distance. He was showing me what to do, you know. So my dad is behind me, so I'm looking over there at my uncle, like cutting my eye, and I'm doing everything. Man, put that thing in my shoulder, and I swore I took like four steps back, but I fell into my dad's <laughs> arms. <laughs> You know, he was like, yeah, you did good, but let me get that from you. <laughs> like, okay, I, yeah, I did good. I did good. I had to show my daddy what was going on. <laughs> oh, that's cool. That's a good memory. Yeah, so that, that was my first experience uh, with the shotgun. Letting a shotgun beat you up. <laughs> yeah, it got me. It got me. But I had to redeem myself over the years, so um, I'm, I'm pretty decent with a shotgun right now. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I'm, <still> not. <laughs> yeah, so. I'm much better with pistols. Uh, have have you shot a shotgun before, Coach B? Yes. You did? Uh, what was your experience like? Honestly, I don't really remember. I mean, other than shooting a 410, right. um, I shot that, but um, I, I think I shot a 12 gauge. No. Yeah. Um, I, I really don't remember. Yeah, you got to remember when, when I was like, what, 13, 14 years old? I bought big as Emma right now. <laughs> Won't big as nothing. <laughs> thing go off man it's throwing me across the city <laughs> that's a that's a lot for a for a little kid yeah yeah it, it was a it was a lot going on right there but um on a more serious note i wanted to ask you two and bring y'all into this conversation about the possible effects that's going to take the turn of events when it comes to firearm laws across the nation mm -hmm. all right so the first thing I do want to say to everyone out there, everybody is on social media in a sense of speaking and everything is a joke. But right now, you should not be joking about what the politicians are doing, what the politicians are saying. There should not be any memes coming up in any sense of a joke when it comes to firearm and the future state of firearms the only thing that really should be going on in my personal opinion is everyone who has a firearm in a sense or who cares about the second amendment they need to be getting on the phones contacting their state representatives both senators and congressmen and expressing your views of the current laws that are about to be changed in the same sense, if you don't want to make a phone call, email them, right? There are plenty of resources out there whereas you can contact these representatives and state your where you stand when it comes to the Second Amendment because of the fact we can all sit back, we can joke about it. But the thing is, you got to remember these politicians work for you. And when you do make that phone call, you do send out that email, they have to listen to you because this is what the majority of the constituents want. But if you could sit back all day and talk on social media, you could talk on a podcast, those cries are not being heard. So instead of putting up the funny memes about what politician is doing, what, who said what, whatever, take that same energy and contact those representatives and let it be known what you want. And then you will see change happen once everybody pulls together for that same reasoning. So it's, this is something I've seen for a while. Like when stuff started coming up, you start seeing people joking about certain measures, especially when it comes to firearms, right? And you gotta look at the seriousness of what's going on, especially when somebody said, hey, they're coming after like whatever organization or 
they want to do this because this is something that's serious in their viewpoint. And if a lawmaker says that, you have to take it serious because don't look at it as, okay, they're coming after the NRA. <laughs> they're coming after you because once they get rid of the NRA, that lobbyist is out of the way, that organization is out of the way, it's easier now to start changing the laws you know, when it comes to that Second Amendment or changing the Second Amendment as is known, you know? So what's your take on that? I would say I agree. Um, instead of using social media, it should be that you email the politicians, email, write, call, whatever it is you have to do because they're not looking at your personal social media. So that's not mm -hmm. gonna help matters. You've got to get out and talk. Yeah. So, well, I think to put it in a better sense of what you're saying is put a video up that shows, hey, if you live in this state or live in this district, call this number and this is the number to this representative. This is that person's email address. Hey, if you live in this zip code or in this area, contact them right now and express whatever. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yes. What's your take on it, Dave? I have a lot of emotion. Yeah, oh, yeah, <laughs> trust me, I know. Uh, about I know. What, what's going on now. Um, but I, through a Second Amendment activist group that I'm involved with a little bit in South Carolina, we've gotten in touch with uh, uh, Lindsey Graham um, in South Carolina, and he still appears to be you know, in, in, in support of, of our Second Amendment rights and, and should, you know, be defending that for us as far as the information that we've gotten from him. Um, he seems like he's still in, in, you know, with us. But it's, it, you know, we play, we play games with, with guns and uh, it's, it's hard sometimes for even just talking to my wife about it because you know, we, we play these, these practical shooting games and, and, and whatever. And, and, but this is, you know, it would affect that too. The, the things that some of the uh, house house representative representatives are proposing now would affect our games our shooting games, but it's more, it's above that. It's beyond that. It's, it's, it's about our freedom and being able to defend our freedom mm -hmm. Um, I'm involved with uh, some through through my work. We we do some manufacturing for um, um, other firearm industries um, outside of the just consumer base, and and they are steadily buying firearms as fast as they can. And now our our current government is trying to remove firearms um as quickly as they can from the consumer base but yet they're they're buying as many as they can so that seems alarming to me um that they're trying to arm themselves as well as they can while disarming us as well as they can right. um and, and it, it 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 that doesn't it should it's not right because they essentially, like what you're saying, they work for us. They're supposed to work for us. We're supposed to be in this together. We're supposed to be trying to do what's best for our country in, in a joint effort and defending our freedoms and our constitutional rights um, is part of that joint effort. And the Second Amendment, um, you know, however anyone feels about it, it's really the amendment that kind of helps us make sure that the rest of the constitution can be maintained. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of scary hearing about some of these, um, some of these bills that, that the current administration is wanting to put in place and, and limit some of the God given rights um, uh, that, you know, that we have. Yeah. So one thing, if you studied history or if you even know history, you know this country was formulated on violence and firearms. 
But in that same breath, you have to understand what took place when they say, you know, we broke away from England. What took place during the Civil War? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? All these battles that led up to, okay, we putting all this stuff on paper, but what actually ended up causing that for that to take place? And even when you look at the wording of it, it's very direct, but it can also be perceived as being very vague in a sense. But in the sense, back 1700, and then we're right now in 2020, and those words are still relevant today because it's the law and how we look at it. And you're jeopardizing that. So, you know, the Second Amendment is the gateway to the other amendments. So once you change the second, you can change the first. You can change it, everything. It, the voting, yeah. <laughs> you know. It really is but, because then, then the government no longer works for the people. Yeah, the people will be totally scared of the government. Yep. So like I said, it's kind of scary, but in the same sense, um, I just will ask everybody, please contact your state representatives, get on the phones, send out emails, mail in letters, do what you have to do and um, get your voice heard. You know, because the bottom line is any bill that comes up and if the constituents are stating what they want to take place, they literally have to listen because they are working for you you know so that was just something that been bothering me over the course of the past couple of years when you see something serious going on and then everybody is out there cutting jokes just joking about, the about situation it yeah instead and, of actually doing something about it yeah so i'm more like if you was to actually put that same energy forward would we be in a situation we're in now because we already know the strength is in the numbers, but if everybody who supports the Second Amendment were to come out, speak up, and go to every function, and we already know that can't happen, but you know, you go to every function that has something to do with the firearm where the rights are in jeopardy, would we be dealing with the same thing we're dealing with today? You know, so I, I mean, know. it's a theory based question, but. So a lot of people, I don't know, I think they have a misunderstanding about the Second Amendment and, and our rights and our freedoms when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. And and the NRA, when you, you mentioned that earlier, and a lot of people have a misunderstanding about the NRA. I know there's been some controversy about, about the NRA and their actions over the last couple of years and just the the management and, and the business aspect, aspects of what's been going on there, but they're, they're restructuring that now. But aside mm -hmm. from that, they're, they're one of the biggest um, civil rights groups that we, that we've ever had in this country. And, and that's exactly what they're doing. They're trying to protect our civil rights um, that have been granted to us through the constitution of our country. Right. Um, man, it's a, uh, it's, it, you know, it is in dire importance that, that we, we support what's going on. Oh, yeah. So, but like I said, you always have people who don't take the time to research or understand. But when you listen to acts of history being discussed, a lot of people don't realize what was put on the line to actually form this country yeah you that's know what I'm saying? one of the things that that disgusts me the most mm -hmm. when, when i hear some of these you know some of these comments and things my my family uh did not fight and die for the freedoms that we have right now to for it to just be thrown away right yep so touchy it's touchy but at the same yep. time it's a conversation you you need to have because we already know this country isn't perfect. Nobody is perfect. No, but never at the same be. time, you know, in order for us to get to where we feel we need to get to as a people, we have to all stand up for something and then move forward from that block. Not just talking about the second amendment and moving forward. I'm talking about life in general. So 
you know, we, we all have to come together in order to live together. That's what the bottom line is. We're all here. I've actually tried to talk with, with some of the, I don't even, I don't even like to refer to left or right groups. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. People have, they, they put so much into, into political groups that I don't even know what to even call anyone anymore. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't like to call anyone anything because (laughs) I I like to feel like we're all in it, you know, together. And I've heard so many people just over the last year or so that there, there were so much separation is being created and it doesn't make sense to me. I've heard people say that I, that, It was a quote that I've heard that I live in a different world than you do. And that's not the case. I mean, (laughs) there's only one world here. We're we're all here living in this world together. And if you want to separate yourself from these other people, you know, that's, I I don't know, man, we have to be in, 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 in it together. I understand. I understand what you're saying. And depending on, that topic of discussion, yes and no, you know what I'm saying? But you have to look at it from the standpoint of one reason is, and let's look at it from a race standpoint. When you hear somebody say but race, different world, you know, then yeah. we all live in the same world, but it's a different between your world and my world. Um, the whole thing is when you look at cert- a certain way of living, a lot of it is based off of myths and, you know, the belief that was formulated back in the past, you know? So yeah, yeah, I see that. When you look at me, do you think I'm going to steal from you, hurt you or whatever? And you don't know nothing about me, but then when you actually get to know me, you'll be like, Oh man, you're one of the nicest people out there. But instantly when people see me because of my size and the color of my skin, I'm already prejudged, you know what I'm saying? Um, anytime you go to like, um, like say like if we go to court for a speeding ticket, mm-hmm. you and I um, did the same exact crime, more than likely you're gonna get the lesser punishment than I will, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. When it comes to fines, um, what the fines, of course. And even when you turn around and you look at other instances where people have committed crimes in the past, same crime, you know, somebody of a different, you know, um, race. And the person who looks more like me are going to get tried twice as hard. So that's when they say the the worlds are different, right? Because you're not getting judged fairly, you know, and yeah. it, every situation is not like that. But, you know, that's the reality of what we have to deal with. But it's something that probably will never change, but it can be controlled, you know, in a sense of speaking. So I could see that if you're looking at it at, from, from that viewpoint, the, right. it would seem like different worlds Yeah, because it, because it is, I mean, at, yeah, from that viewpoint, yeah, it is. Right. Even though you're, you're, you're going through the same experiences, you're, you're experiencing different things. Right. And there's a, like a lot of kids that I speak with, um, in the neighborhood and just throughout the city. And when you get to talking with them and you see that light bulb come on, I was like, man, I, I would love to see a lot of these children jump into the political realm, um, become a lawyer. You know, now here you are, now you're the um, the coroner for the city or the probate judge for the city, you know, or now the same little kid who was a troublemaker, his eyes opened up when he was like 16, 17 years old. Now he's running for Congress or a Senator. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know what I'm saying? So I, I, I love it when that takes place because we can all sit back and say a kid's going to be a kid, but we were all kids at one time and the path you went on, something actually turned that light switch on for you to turn the course of life that you're living right now. Mm-hmm. It was sooner for some, later for others. So yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, but that life experience is what it what it makes it out to be. But in the same sense, 
we're not saying make excuses for people. It's just a matter of if we're all sharing a common interest, which are the laws in the country, okay, we all got to live by that. Let's all live by them. But let's don't put these laws in jeopardy of another law changing that's going to impact a certain group of people because I've said this for years and the new racism is going to be your income bracket. I honestly believe that. Um, It's it's already started. Um, Well, I mean, it's it's been there. It's been there and it's getting worse. Yeah. And your new paycheck is going to be education. Um, Unlike it was from when my parents were growing up, it was all based off of your work ethics. You know what I'm saying? Getting stuff done. Of course, now when we growing up, it's all about, oh, you don't have enough experience to do this job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Now, <clears throat> when the little assistant, you know, starts and when she comes into that work arena, now it's going to be, oh, you have to have at least an associate's degree to have this job. You know what I'm saying? So, a lot of it is like that already. Yeah. 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 It's, you can see it's going that way. It's slowly but surely breaking into that arena. So, um, but it's just one of those type things that, like I said, we just have to be proactive in society to, to make sure we are getting what is deserving of the way of life. We and do. We can't I, let people dictate yeah. and control it just because we voted them into office. So we have to do our part just because we, we did the vote. The checks and balance system is we have to talk to them, to those who we voted into office and make sure they're doing what they promised or we we want this to go this way as the people under your leadership yeah i I think like you said i mean voting is very important part of it Mm -hmm. but it's not the only part of it like you don't stop just after you 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 go vote this is your job's not done then as a citizen um like you were saying you need to get involved you need to talk to people um talk to people in office let them know you know how you're feeling um stay stay proactive with it um so we can so we can maintain our rights and our freedom emma what do you what do you want to do what are your goals for when you grow up being a teacher i'm speaking to the mic being a teacher a teacher that is awesome goal my wife is a teacher actually what do you want to teach? Art. Art? I love art. I'm, I'm not very good at it at all, but <laughs> I like it. It's fun. <laughs> My wife teaches uh, elementary school. There's some art on for the YouTube viewers. I think that's excellent art. It's very colorful. Yeah. I like it. We call it uh, scribble art. That's what she dubs it as. Yeah. And I guess it's just a expression of whatever she's thinking at that time and oh that's great and she when she came in and gave it to me she gave me a breakdown of what each area of the art meant so i was like oh yeah i love it i love it that's awesome yeah yeah but i take all her art and i keep all her art and um at one point in time i said i was gonna put it in a frame and just hang it around the house um at one point my refrigerator was so full you couldn't even see the handle because there was so much you know stuff on there with the magnets and everything <laughs> so awesome. um i still i keep all the art she does and i'm just going to figure out I'll probably like lace like um el cabanino where i do the reloading and mm-hmm. everything i'll probably just lace that with all her artwork on the wall so what a great way to get involved with our with our society and, and helping to, you know, to push some positive views with people, then, then become, becoming a teacher. What a great way to, uh, to help people. I think that's excellent. I'm excited for you to become an art teacher. Maybe I can take a class with you. You going to teach them how to do art? Yeah. 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 (laughs) I've always liked painting, like uh, oil painting and pastel painting and stuff. I I don't really know anything about it, but I just like people. It looks.
looks so smudgy. Smudgy. Well, that's all right. I've seen some really crazy looking paintings in museums that people really love and pay a lot of money for. Mm -hmm. I can't make out what in the world they're actually supposed to be, but some people really like them. So smudgy paintings are, are okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, we're going to go ahead and um, prepare for this commercial break to come up here shortly. And um, like I said, at the beginning of the second segment of the show, JJ Rakaza was the interviewer for this week, or is he the interviewee? E, I think. E, yeah, he would be the interviewee. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah for me, I'm the er. <laughs> so, and his schedule was so busy that I wanted to bring him on when we did this recording, but the way his schedule was in the calendar, because you remember we was trying to get a hold of JJ for like eight months to bring them on yeah, to the it's show. Been a while to... It's been like hectic and between the Instagram chats, the text messaging, and then the back and forth between his wife and myself, man, it was like his schedule is. Whew. Yeah, I know he was moving also. He's moving from the West coast back to the East coast. And yeah, and then I think he had some family stuff going on and yeah now he's trying to teach and organize all that yeah he's yeah, been busy like i said it was just i want to say when he was moving the day he actually moved to florida the next day was like a class he had to give <laughs> you know so i was like man when are you gonna take a break man but like when you look at his schedule it's popping it's well he go, can go, go, that's go, go. that's his livelihood now he yeah. can't take a break yeah but um we, we had a pretty in-depth conversation. And if when you listen to this conversation, like I told you, he called out the Mad cool. Scientist. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I was more like, okay, here we go. Let the fun begin. <laughs> I haven't had a chance to shoot with him since he moved back to the East Coast yet, but but right. I'm sure I'll see him soon. Yeah, so um, like I said, we, we talked a little bit about the matches that he has coming up. And I do know that he will be doing nationals. And, but we didn't get into the other major matches that he was going to shoot as um, far as his schedule goes because in conversation, it sounded like he was still working on his schedule. But I do yeah. know he stated that nationals was what he was going to be at. You know, for one guaranteed match for next year was nationals. Or this year. No, I'm sorry. But, um, yeah, let's go ahead and um, – Get ready. Hold on. Before we do that, you got anything else you want to talk about there, Coach B? I'm good. Yeah, you see, you see what I'm saying? You put a put a microphone in front of her face. Now you still get the hand and arm signals. <laughs> you don't <laughs> you don't get the vocal <laughs> the vocal answers anymore. You still get the the head and arm. <laughs> Coach B, when's your next uh, match? I know for sure the South Carolina match, but before that, honestly, I'm really not sure. I have some personal things I'm working on. I got a personal goal that I got to meet. Yeah. Hopefully mm -hmm. by March. That's my plan anyway. And that's going to take a lot of my time. So I'm not going to have time for a dry fire. And What? You get, better have uh, time for dry fire. Uh, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear it. Yeah, mm -hmm. Like I said, if anything. Make time. Um, Make time yeah. for dry mm -hmm. fire. What I'm thinking about doing is implementing Cause you know, like when she puts on the calendar, I got to do something. So I'm thinking about <laughs> returning that favor <laughs> at least two times a week, dry fire, you know, and then yeah. after she gets finished with this project that she has to work on, then turn it around and now bump it up to at least four times a week, you know, going into the South Carolina state. Well, match. good. It said the match is coming up soon. Yeah. It'll be here before you know it. So yeah, if I can get my project done by the 1st of March, then I'll be good. Good. Can... I'll give you a month. Yeah. Yeah, I think that'll be enough time for her to, to rock it out. Yep. Right. So you got anything else you want um, to um, put in the ears of the good people there, Dave? Um, I've started in a, a group on MeWe. Um, what's, so... what's MeWe? It's a, a relatively new social media group um, where you are not concerned about censorship when it comes to the 2A community. That stuff has kind of been happening, um, or, you know, around Facebook and, and 
Instagram and YouTube a little bit. And um, I'm just getting it started. It seems like it might be a good thing. Still kind of a small um, community there, but um, MeWe.com, um, CSRA Shooters, check us out there. Uh, still, still on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Um, but it's a, it's just another uh, social media platform that I'm that I'm investigating and uh, checking out. Okay, I want to say I heard somebody talking about me we before, and I kind of laughed at the name when I first heard. It. I never really looked into. Well, it, it is a it silly about. name, but it's yeah. um. But it's something that it will stick because it's so silly, you know, it's catchy. But I never researched it, but I think I might check it out. Go it's, ahead and check uh, it out and see what well, it's about. Well, Parler was, was the another social media platform that I was interested in, but they got Turned pretty off. well <laughs> removed from the internet. Right. <laughs> um, because of powers to be and... Right that's a little concerning for me and you know? it's just um the the mewe platform something else i'm looking into man my social media only reaches out to facebook instagram and twitter but like i said majority of the time the stuff that's being posted on social media is coach b posting it anyway it's not me posting it so i just sit back and when people say something i'll be like huh Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I got to turn my phone on and be like, oh, let me do what they're talking about. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, I got you. <laughs> so, um, but you know how that goes sometimes. But yeah, um, I try to stay, majority of the time you see me on my phone, I'm playing a game on my phone. <laughs> you know, um, was it pool, chess, Sudoku, <laughs> the brick, game you take a ball and you got to break the bricks you know but i do that stuff just to stay busy when i have to time when i'm on my phone emma what's your favorite phone game Uh oh what's your what's your game on the tablet you play my hide and seek game yeah hide and seek yeah it's it's pretty interesting when if you hear us say it you'd be like hold on we used to play that when we were kids but the game literally is a little humanoid figure Mm-hmm. And then you see somebody else with like a red triangle radar bar and they're chasing around and you just got to try to avoid them. And it's like a maze. You got to run around there. Oh, it's pretty okay. interesting. I yeah. Like, okay. But I like it because it really focuses on hand and um, hand and eye coordination. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So. And it's also very fun because there's also like, coins and like gold bars and there's also like a thing when you can go through like the walls and there's also one when you're really fast oh it's like a speed boost yeah yeah awesome and there's that also does a bonus fun. level with a lot of coins excellent i like coins yeah yeah so like i said the game is pretty <laughs> interesting she sat there and gave me a in-depth you know, tutorial of what to do, how to play it, how to get to it. (laughs) So I was like, yeah, I'm ready for this hide and seek game now. So, but she she did that before we went to dinner. Like we were sitting there, we was waiting and she gave me that little class and I was very cool. Sounds like a lot more than just hide and seek. It sounds fun. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's there's a lot more to it, but um, at the same time, you just got to restrict a lot of nonsense that your children get into, (laughs) but luckily she's not into that stuff. (laughs) you know so. well it's a trap yeah a lot of people try to too. trap you into it so. yeah but um let's go ahead and jump into this commercial and then um hear what our sponsors have to say but then turn up your headsets and the volumes on your car radios or even your stereo in your house and let's hear what jj has to say in regards to the challenge yeah, I can't wait. Mad <laughs> Let's see what JJ's got to say. <laughs> He's only been doing so, this for about 25 years. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so um, without further ado, please, everyone, stay in your seats, turn the volume up, and here are a few words from our sponsors. Hey, this is Brian Conley with Hunter's HD Gold, and you are listening to the M-W Tactical Podcast.
What's up, good people? Thank you for taking the time and listening to the M-W Tactical Podcast. Please, go visit the M-W Tactical store at www.m-wtactical.com forward slash store and help support our efforts by purchasing a shirt or two. If you haven't done so, go follow us on Instagram and Facebook by searching for M-W Tactical. The gun cleaners. Our solvent is, I think, second to none. Our lube is second to none. Their lube's heavier than water, which is just a huge thing. People don't really put a lot of thought into that, just how huge that is to have on your gun, especially if you can still carry. The gun cleaners. Oh, yeah, most definitely. You know, you're going to sweat a lot of the other lubes off. With ours, it'll stay there. The gun cleaners. And maintaining the quality of the process, the quality of the end result, is another and you guys are able to do both with the process that you have there order your supply of the lube and the solvent at www.theguncleaners.com are you in the market to purchase your first or next firearm but find the atmosphere of a gun store intimidating crowded or uninviting there's a way for you to purchase the gun you want while avoiding the crowds the gruff salesmen and the marked up prices that come with a brick and mortar gun store the process is called a transfer, where the purchase is made in an online store or it's sent to a federally licensed middleman called an FFL who processes the paperwork and background check for a firearm purchase. CAE Transfers is the FFL with the lowest transfer cost in the Midlands at only $20 or $15 with the presentation of a South Carolina concealed weapons permit and $10 for repeat customers. If you live in Columbia, South Carolina or its surrounding areas, choose CAE Transfers as your FFFL during checkout and let me help you complete your online gun purchase. You can find and follow CAE Transfers online at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram using at CAE Transfers. Thank you for your business and I look forward to seeing you soon. I'm Jason Pratt, Masterclass USPSA shooter, owner of Brass Monkey Bullets. If you're interested in competition bullets, Visit www.brassmonkeybulletsllc.com or call me at 423-967-1063. For more information, my email is brassmonkeybulletsllc at gmail.com. Thank you. What's up, good people? This is Michael Woodland from M-W Tactical. This is Coach B from M-W Tactical. And we are asking for your help with two GoFundMe campaigns that we have started. The first one is we are making a professional movie and it's gonna be about our day-to-day life within the sport of shooting. Details about this campaign can be found by visiting gofundme.com forward slash we are making a professional movie. The second campaign, we are asking for you to donate to give financial assistance for those who cannot financially get the training they deserve. Remember, there are a lot of first time gun owners out there and I am asking for everyone in the gun industry to come together and make our community stronger. For more details, visit gofundme.com forward slash free firearms training. Remember how important training is to keep everyone informed and safe. All right, good people, we're back at it again. And thank you for sitting through the commercial breaks. And this week's interview, we have someone that everybody looks at as far as speed. They look at this guy as an immortal. This guy is phenomenal when it comes to shooting, right? So I've been following him for a couple years. I actually spoke to him on a number of occasions and to actually get him on the podcast, I had to give out my left kidney to make this happen, you know? So without further ado, I would like to welcome JJ Ricasa to the M-W Tactical Podcast. How's it going for you, JJ? Hey, man, Mr. Willard, good to see you again, sir. It's been good. It's been really good. Life's good here. Uh, Moved from Vegas to Florida, so here we're surrounded by family. So it's been a different lifestyle, and it's been amazing. Oh, man. So... Uh, I can honestly tell you, by me being ex-military, I hated moving, literally. And when I was stationed at Fort Stewart, 
I purposely kept re-enlisting to stay at Fort Stewart just so I can avoid moving. Because <laughs> right? I ended up staying there for like eight or nine years or something like that. <laughs> the, the things that you do, right? I've heard so many stories of people re-enlisting just to, just, to, just, just for random reasons. Oh, I got to re-enlist for this, <laughs> for another Camaro, for whatever it may be. Right. <laughs> but yours was like, I don't want to freaking move. I don't want to do another PTS. Man, I, I hated it because what actually ended up taking place was when I, at that time frame, it was like you would stay at one location for two years, then you get orders and it's time to go. And by the time you finish unpacking everything, it's time to pack it back oh. up. That's oh. the thing I hated the most, you know? So re-enlisting was the reason I stayed in Georgia for so long. And then um, after that, they changed the standards, I guess, cause then it went to like, you stay at a location for at least three to five years. And that was based on your rank. And by the time I ended up leaving um, Fort Stewart, I was already at E6. And then when I made E7, and it was just easier after that. Rolling in the money at that time. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, the first time I actually spoke with you, it was a couple years ago, and it was on social media. And I had just missed you because you had came out to Fort Benning and I missed you by like a couple hours. And it was only because I was on a detail and we was actually talking through chat and you was like, yeah, we'll catch up eventually. And then the next time I seen you, it was at SHOT Show. And um, it was like, I turned around. I was like, yo, that was JJ. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody was like, what? I said, yeah, just as fast as he's shooting, look how fast he's walking. <laughs> right? And that was on the range day uh, when I saw That's you that first right. time. That's right. Yeah. And then the next time I actually saw you was on the floor and we spoke for like about two or three minutes, but it was more people wanting to get your picture and everything. And I just wanted to talk. So I was like, okay, I'll catch up with you. And then um, the next time I seen you, it was at Nationals. Yeah. Right? And then, like I said, we sat there, we talked for like maybe six minutes at Nationals. And then it was um, the arrangements of trying to get you onto the podcast. So like I said, I'm just glad you're here to actually do the podcast. Hey, man, I just also want to, I want to say thank you so much for having me and having like, the patience and fortitude to like stick with it, <laughs> to get me <laughs> on. But really the magic connection there was my wife. Like when she my hit my wife up, like people always say, hey, dude, I want to get you on. Like they go right to me thinking that's like the straight, like, like that's like the easiest path right. to get me on. But I'm such a scatterbrain because I got so many things I'm trying to do mm -hmm. that whatever I just had a conversation an hour ago, I'm already moving on to the next one. If you, unless you hit me up constantly, right. I'll always, you know, I will never get to pass it on to my wife. Mm -hmm. So with the way you just did it, you hit up my wife and she was like, hey, this to this. I'm like, gosh, She's like, all right, I guess I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Like, like I said, I appreciate it. But um, your wife was, it was funny through the email traffic. So I was just like, oh, okay. She's, she has humor to her also. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she does. She does. Yeah. So that's what it is. So um, I don't want to ask the same questions that everybody else has been asking. Like, um, where did you start? How did you start and all that? Because um, I feel like I already know that about you. And anybody who is listening, they can actually go to any interview and just track like how you actually got started and everything. But I would like to start from the um, sponsorship deal with Beretta. How did that come about? And then how much input did you have with Beretta for the firearm that you're using? Gosh, man, you know, that's, I get goosebumps every time someone asks me about that Beretta, but it has, I haven't had many interviews about it. I had like a couple of quick interviews like, hey, dude, you sign up. That's a big deal and all that stuff. The way that happened, I'm going to tell you right now, it was straight up luck. Like there was a few decisions prior to that I ended up, I was supposed to shoot for another company, right? I'm going to remain nameless. I'm not going to name anyone, whatever. But it was a contract I've already written up and we agreed on a contract and the terms. And however, that particular company couldn't get me an open gun. My deal was give me a gun, give me a gun so I can test it for at least a thousand rounds or test it in practice or shoot it in matches or whatever, right? And for some reason, somehow one way or another, they could never get me a gun. Even a loaner gun, they could never get me a gun. And then here, lo and behold, I get a call out of nowhere. It's like, hey, we heard that you might've signed for this particular company, but we'd like to see if there's any way 
you would be available within a year, you'd be um, available for some sort of feedback with a gun whatsoever. And I just kind of corrected them. I said, well, I'm technically not signed because I never committed. I have a contract written up, but I'm not signed contract. So I'm kind of technically available. So I'm a free agent. And they immediately jumped on the gun and Beretta mm -hmm. didn't waste any time. Beretta um, immediately made a call and made it happen and flew me out. And they said, what does it take to get you to sign with, with us? I said, well, in order for me to sign with you guys, I had to, I have to test the gun. I would have to like it. And then from there, see how the deal would, would turn out. And they, they, they couldn't get the gun to the U S cause there were some, um, ATF forms they had to get, um, the production 92 F at uh, the 92, uh, performance, this one right here, um, was already in the U S but however, I wanted to test the open gun cause that's the one I wanted to pursue for now. And so they couldn't get that gun for some reason, ATF designed it. There was different guns, whatever. So they found out a way and they said, so, am I available to fly to Italy? And once I flew me to Italy, they gave me, they, they put me in a range with three of their guys or four of their guys with a couple of media guys there. And they loaded mags for me. It would like literally loaded mags for me. And I would shoot and I said, all right, I'm going to shoot this for a thousand rounds and see what it is. I got, I think within 15, 20 minutes, I got to an open gun alone. I got to about 1200 rounds. And then they were like, well, try not to burn out the gun. That's getting really hot. Cause 15 minutes and 20 minutes, I've shot over a thousand rounds already. Like nonstop. The second I turn around mags that were on floor, they had mat new mags replacing for me. So I said, okay, let me shoot the production gun. Production gun I shot, I shot another, goodness gracious, in like 20 minutes, I shot another like 1,000 rounds or so, right? Within an hour, I got about 2,000 uh, 2, rounds. And immediately they were like, well, what do you think of the gun? Um, how is it? And I said, well, the gun, the gun's good. And they were like, well, it's been 2,000 rounds. You said you need 1,000. Uh, you, you have a couple more hours here in range, but I would like to finalize this. And I said, <laughs> I'm, I've been sold. For like after the first 300 rounds, I just wanted to keep taking advantage of people loading for me because I never really quite had that. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so that's kind of how it happened. I, I fell in love with the gun, the guns, the trigger reset and all that stuff, the, 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 the way they designed it, even though it's very almost like rough edge of the 92 um, performance, it, it, it was kind of patched up together. It's not the most beautiful this, the gun in terms of aesthetics, but mm -hmm. the way it tracked, the way it performed, and being that this is their generation one, I had like, to me, I almost had the, 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 had to think about what we would look like in the future once they've had several years working down the road or this particular gun. And so they, they were like, well, let's go back to the shop. And we gave you, a, they gave me a corner, they gave me their lead engineer, they gave me a computer guy. And they said, I'm like, what can I change with the gun? They said, let's see, let's start with it. I said, well, I'm gonna start with the trigger and immediately within, I would say 20 minutes, they changed the trigger for me and then installed hmm. a new part in there, tested it in a range. I said exactly where I wanted it. Let's move on to the, the mount, the change in the thumb rest. And they were willing to change quite a lot of stuff, not, not necessarily the frame or some of the other stuff that's already been hardened, but like everything around it, they were able to change it, to include the, the racker, um, the trigger, the mount, and then, yeah, and then the magwell, like all that stuff kind of, and they were very open-minded about it. And I've never had a company that was, that let me run my reign essentially on the gun. And so coming up, they were already kind of starting to design other guns. And they said, well, we need your feedback. Give us a list of what you want. And all these lists are just like, okay, we're going to make sure it's heard. It's not just make a list. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do. These guys, mm -hmm. it's been a totally different experience. And the whole, I was blown away basically by the way I've been treated with Beretta. It has been an amazing ride even though it's been about a year and a half um, or two years now, I guess, coming up. Oh, wow. So now your division of choice, I would take it is open, but yes. there's also at the production nationals also. Yes, sir. So now are those the only two divisions you shoot or do you venture into carry optics or single stack? Yes. So I would love to shoot every division, right? right. If I could, um, <laughs> Single stack is something that I'll probably come back to later on. But for now, open is an unfinished business. I, my goal is to win the world championship in Ipsic. If I win that one, I can put a check mark on that one and probably move on to production or carry optics, one or the two. Um, obviously, I shoot production, but I would love to start shooting carry optics as well. Um, it's, it would be fun to compete against Max again and, and to see what it would look like in that division and how that game plays. 
Um, Max is just dominating the hell out of that. So it'd be nice to see how it would run and how would how we would be able to fare out, right? And then limited is also one of my favorite divisions. Anything iron sights really, I like a lot. Um, over the dot, I actually like iron sights a lot more than I, I do with red dot, but red dot is just where you push yourself beyond that comfort level. And then, and then, you know, it's a new age thing. So let's try it out and see what it is. And I've been, I, I realized the other day, I came back home from a trip and I was sitting there thinking in the airport and I realized I've been shooting behind a red dot since 1989 or 1990. So that's been a very long time. Yeah. But the one thing about that time is you get seasoned with it and you know how to tweak it far as performance to step it up or pull back a little bit. Yeah. You, you, you see, you see the revolution of mm-hmm. the whole technology base, basically. And at this point in time, they've gotten smaller and smaller, not only smaller, but the, you know, the parallax issues are gone. The, the, the way the glass doesn't move, it's gone. The tubular thing, got, well, let me say, let me correct myself. A couple of companies recently came up with the, the tubular thing. Uh, so I don't know, you know, there's, there's weird. It's like, it's like, it's like a full circle. They go away from the tubular thing till you can see more in this little pane of glass and then all of a sudden oh let's go back to this tube again because it's smaller or whatever i'm like oh gosh this is this is we're going back in circles <laughs> yeah that's how it's a different way business. Yeah. <laughs> so like you limited is my favorite division um the co-host um dave the mad scientist he's always been like hey try open try open try open and i keep telling him i'm scared of open and the only reason I'm scared of open is because that is a lot of money to put into that division, you know? So especially like the whole gun, because for people who don't know an open gun baseline, like the minimum I seen was like $7,000. And that's like, like the top companies. But if you get like a real custom made gun, that's going to run you at least, you know, $10,000 plus. So yeah. I'm like, and then you got to change out all your gear, <laughs> your magazines. And I'm like, oh my goodness, man. So that's the only thing when I say I'm scared of it, the financial burden that comes with it, that's what I'm scared of. It's a commitment. Yes. And that's what it is. <laughs> you know, So I'm, I'm head in with limited though. So, you know, let me tell you this, that's actually one of the main reasons why I jumped ship from shooting a custom gun that was about $7,200, $7,500. My model at Razor Cat, right, from Limcat. Mm-hmm. Um, that's evolved um, 10 times over already within a few years. Technology keeps pushing, Limcat keeps pushing the designs and all that, all these open guys, right? So I actually wanted to go back to shooting a factory type gun and seeing if I can train myself hard enough on it and bring it to the highest level. So the gun that I'm actually shooting, this particular gun right here, this right here is going to be um, priced at around three thousand ish dollars, just like that, ready to go off the factory, right? And then, so I kind of wanted to see how it would compete against these, like you said, nine thousand, ten thousand dollar guns before even any magazines and stuff like that. And even it's crazy because like you could buy the most expensive one out there, but doesn't necessarily bode that it's a better gun. It's a lot of his preference. So you kind of got to go around there and test it all out. Um, one of my favorite actually is obviously Limcat. I'm biased to that, but one of my favorite other builders is actually um, EMG Customs. I believe this, it's um, by Eddie Garcia. He's, mm. the way he blends those frame to slide, it's it's amazing. Um, it's super smooth, super accurate. He does, he uses all the surface area to lock the slide back into place. So it's really consistent, but anyway, those, but th- even then, that can run you eight thousand dollars easy. Right. You know, that's that's a Honda Civic to me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, um, like when I first got into Limited, I was shooting the Walther Q5, but of course, you know, by shooting the Q5, you're shooting minor, so you're chasing the major guys all day. The next right. um, firearm I ended up purchasing was the STI um, DVCL. Right. I thought I was doing it then until I shot my buddy's um, custom handgun. And I was like, man, what's really going on? I gotta step my game up a little bit more. So that a, a year later, I went ahead and got the um, Brazos Custom, the SC yeah. um, series. And I really love that thing. You know, like, it's like, man, like, okay, what's the, where's the disconnect? But I think what it was, was when Brazos was 
like formulating the business side and the shooting, other people had started stepping in and then it was all about, oh, I can do this, I can do that. But I feel like that firearm is, that's where I should have started at instead of getting the STI. But I didn't know what I know now when I got the SDI. You didn't know what you wanted. Exactly. Right? Simple as that. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty much what it came down to. Brazo's been around for so long. I mean, I've been in the U.S. shooting within the Super Squad since year 2000. Even he used to shoot in the Super Squad as well. Um, I mean, he's gotten a little older and all that stuff, but man, he knows what he knows how to build guns. He's an old school guy right. that went about it, building guns, making them work before he decided to go into the aesthetics, right? Some guys get into the open gun, making it look sexy, and then trying to figure out if we could make it work. Kind of the opposite mindset yeah. than Brazos. Yeah, he's figured it out for quite a while, for quite a long time now. Yeah, like I said, I, I love it. I love it. And one thing I did notice, the first thing I noticed the difference between the STI and the Brazos is it was a little bit wider. And it was that little bit heavier. And then when I went out and shot it, I was like, this is what I was looking for from the start. <laughs> Just that little bit of weight, you know? So like I said, I, I love it. But then again, like I said, with the experience you have, you actually can formulate. And I feel like you can actually look at somebody and say, okay, this might work for you or try this out and then go from there. Because uh, my buddy, Jessica Hook, she actually stated that you was, part of the instrumental assets to get her on to Beretta as well. Yes, sir. Yeah. So she, she gave you a lot of accolades about you That's know, awesome. JJ is the man and he knows exactly what he's talking about. And then she was talking about that, um, the handgun that she got the Beretta. Well, the thing with Jessica is that she's so easy to, to bring in as a shooter. Cause not only is she, um, a good person, there's mm -hmm. no drama behind her in her history. Right. So she's a, you know, she, and she's, um, uh, she's got a good following. She's got a good presence on, on social media and she's pretty active. She, she does a lot of her own videos and all that stuff. Right. Um, and she, although she's not a, like the best shooter in her division, she has a potential to become the best. And I feel, I feel like sometimes people just need that little bit of support and either that will motivate them mm -hmm. or now that they have the support, they have that ability to go, you know what? I got guns now. I can go out there and not be afraid that they'll break because I have this support system. And so she, it was really easy to have her and then to see her kind of grow from there within the, even within the last six months to just see the changes and the more motivated, the more she's pushing herself to be out there a little bit more. I'm yeah. pretty excited to see where she'll be in the next two years. Oh yeah. So I actually ended up taking a class with her. It was a movement class with um, Keita Bussey. Oh, yeah. And just watching how Jessica would break down stuff. And I was like, she's really going to step forward. And once she figures it out, she's going to, it's like, it's going to be a new person. Like, and yeah. she's going to be a beast with it. <laughs> yeah. So that's, she's that's a very uh, cerebral approach to things. I right. guess is the word I would like to say. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the perfect example of how to say it like that. <laughs> so now you did mention like you was on a super squad. So can you tell us, what it was like the first time you actually stepped on the super squad, but then what's the most challenging thing you actually have to deal with while being on the super squad? So first time I've ever been in a super squad, it literally was almost a shock and awe. And I was more in there as a fan mm -hmm. than thinking that I belonged. I felt, I thought it was a, I didn't think it was an accident. I thought I deserved it through what my performance for the year but once I got there, it was kind of one of those where I wasn't, I didn't mentally prepare to it for it. And I kind of was just like, well, I'm here. Shoot, I got to just compete against these guys. Like I was, I'm from the Philippines. I, I was born and raised there until 1993, right? Um, 13 years of my life. And so I didn't have any kind of aspirations or dream to ever shoot with the Super Squad, even to compete alongside with those guys, my idols, like Rob Latham and Jerry Barnhart. And here I am, all of a sudden I'm like thrown in the wolves. And it's like, holy cow, this is Rob Latham standing in front of me. That's Jerry Barnard. He's talking to, like, when does this happen where I become a part of that conversation? When does this happen where I shake their hand and introduce myself? I didn't want to be that guy. So I just went into my shell, closed up, and just said, I'm just going to shoot my own game. But as much as you try to shoot your own game, man, once you do something good, 
like something impressive amongst the super squad. First of all, there's no respect for the new guy, right? They look at you and they go, all right, he's a new guy. See what he can do. And then I was that Filipino guy and everyone in the Filipino industry was always like, oh, they're just fast. Because Casey was here, JoJo was here, they're just fast, whatever. Jet Jethro. And then, so he's going to be fast. Of course, I, I fell into that world. It's like, let me just push myself beyond my capability. And I would have fast times, but I wouldn't have the best hits and all that stuff. But anyway, fast forward through later, you learn through the years and how to manage personalities. The biggest thing nowadays, back then, the biggest thing deal with learning how to deal with the super squad in terms of stress was learning to not look at your idols as idols. You had to treat them as someone that was almost equal to you, as hard as that is, and then just respectfully try to compete and not involve them within your own mind, right? Because a lot of times when you're competing against someone that you're like, holy cow, this is my idol, and all of a sudden you'll shoot worse than you ever did. And it took me a few years to figure that out. Fast forward nowadays, it's kind of weird. I feel like I've been in the, we've been in the game for so dang long that 20 years later, I'm still shooting in a super squad. And now that the culture and the face and the demographic has changed, I was one of the younger guys coming up. And then now I'm one of the older guys. <laughs> and there's a bunch of younger guys looking at me like, holy cow, what is this guy doing? So my, my job now and my pressure now is kind of weird where I don't want, I don't want that new kid on the block just coming in and showing it, showing up and starting to get, they're starting to beat you and all that stuff. Right. So, so I, I push myself harder and that's one. The second thing is it's the same I, I, I game. Like you don't want to be influenced by that person shooting just because it sounds fast or looks like he's the hottest thing in, in, in IPSC or USPSA right now, you kind of just got to still shoot within your game and trust that your game and efficiency and timing is way better than that person. Right. So it, and then also there's a lot more different personalities. I had my own clique for a while. It was Max, Michelle, Chris Tilly, and Casey. We had a little group. We were tight. We would always talk with each other. And now there's this group coming in and they're like, now they're, they're, it's a different weird way. It's like, I feel like they're like the millennials where they kind of coop together and they're just like, we're going to be our own team and we're going to be loud and we're going to talk about each other's field course plan and all this stuff. And I'm like, man, you're, you're sharing all your field course plans. It's like you and I sparring and I'm going to tell you going, hey man, I'm going to jab. I'm going to fake a straight and I'm going to throw a left hook. All right, here we go. Try to stop it. And it's like, it is the dumbest thing in the world, I think, because I grew up in the days where Jerry Barnhart, I would ask him going, hey, sir, how would you run the stage? And he would tell me literally, he goes, as fast as I possibly could. And that's it. No. And Robbie would, would look at me going, yeah, why would you ask that question? Like, this is your plan. Stick with it. And don't try to copy mine because my might be different than yours and mine might be the best. And I don't want to share it with you because you and I are competing mm -hmm. for a title, right? So, and these guys are here going, oh, I want to, I want to share. Why don't, why don't you tell me what you're doing? I'm like, no, it's not. I don't want to tell you what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hide it as long as I possibly could. And, you know, and you can copy it afterwards if you'd like, but I'm not going to, I'm not here to help you. I'm trying to win. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. We're friends out of here, but we're not that close. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> now part of that is i i can get that i do understand that um and i'm the same way in a sense of speaking but if somebody was to ask me like okay what do you plan on doing i would tell them what i plan on doing but of course my plan i never really based my plan off of somebody else i did it one time before and i face planted when i did it oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> so the reason why I don't like to use other people's plans to the exact is because I'm stronger at something that person is not just like they're weaker at something I'm not. So I might take their plan and maybe tweak it a little bit to comfort me. But in the gist of things, I'm like, okay, whatever you do is whatever you do. This is what I'm going to do. Now I might ask, okay, what's your direction of travel, where you start and where you're ending? And then I might analyze that compared to what I've done. But outside of that, I like to do it all myself, <laughs> unless it's something I really get stuck on or the course has it, whereas it really forces everybody to do the same exact thing. That's the only thing as far as me with stage planning goes, <laughs> you know. But it's also like one of those type things, whereas you're always developing and you're learning more about yourself the more you do it as well. You know, it's funny. That's a very like well experienced, well said what you just said, man. Because I tell all the guys all the time, people want to watch a super squad to get the best plan. And I, I tell all my students all the time, I said, hey, it's not always about the best plan. 
it's about the execution and how you execute mm -hmm. it and what with what you're strong at like i might be move into position and move out of position because i feel really comfortable shooting on the move a lot of times mm -hmm. and i figured it out how to do it right long time ago. and i've said several reps but if you copy my plan and you're not comfortable moving in moving out of position or shooting targets on the move that's going to give you the best plan for you, for me, not for you, but you're going to have a shitty result. And you're going to think, man, that was the best plan. I don't know why I lost seven seconds because you didn't merge positions and all these other things. Right. So yeah, that's a hundred. I agree with you hundred percent. Right. Now, who is the person that you felt like is your arch nemesis, but you still have that cordial conversation with them, not to say like there's enemies in shooting, um, but the person who, you're tracking, whereas you saying, okay, I want to be ahead of this person or I need to beat them in this competition. For a while there, it was always, um, it was always the three guys. It was Max, Chris Tilly and Casey. And that's always, oh, well, it, for a while it was all Robbie, Jerry and Todd and all these big boys like Mike Boyd, right? You chase them. And, when, and then once all of a sudden, like they start going other divisions, it was like left between the four of us, Chris Tilly, Max and Casey and I, and then, now all the other guys have started to divert into other divisions. I think there's only Chris Tilly, Casey, and I left kind of in the in the open game racing around. So now it's changed, and now there's I would say Christian Sailor is a new guy. Um, there's a like Speedy Lesgar who's, who's come a long way recently within the last few years. So like those kind of guys. But really, even to this day, um, I would say there are two people that I'm really um, that I'm really close with, but I'm really we're still trying to chase amongst each other. We just kind of haven't shot in the same division in a, in a while. And, and we still have these great conversations where we'll have in-depth talk. We're literally good, good friends, right? I consider these guys really good friends. It would be Max, all right? And then, so when I shoot carry optics, I would actually have to let him know and ask permission. <laughs> this is like, hey man, I'm gonna go shoot for uh, carry optics. Um, later this year, I'm just giving you a heads up type thing. Not a permission, but like, hey, I'm just giving you a heads up that I'll actually shoot in this division. And then Eric is the same exact thing. Eric and I talk quite a bit, um, several times a month, FaceTime each other, doing busting chops, doing whatever. Um, and then it's the same thing. Like he, him and I kind of separated our own ways going, he's gonna shoot this and I'm gonna shoot this. And we were supposed to be teammates and then uh, we're supposed to shoot different divisions or whatever. But then now that I went with um, another company and then shooting Beretta, shooting open, they're also developing their open gun in their world. So he might come back to the open world or same thing. He might come back to um, carry optics because that's something he's never done or won in a world championship. So he's hungry for another title. Uh, even though he said he was going to retire after the last world shoot, he's probably going to come back. A guy like that who's competing all, all his life is just not going to stop and yeah. sit and watch. Yeah, I mean, you gotta if you feel it, even if you're watching other people, you're like, I still got it. I'm coming back, just like yeah. Michael Jordan did. <laughs> oh yeah. And what did he do when he came back? He won like three more world ch championships, right? Yeah. And then Unreal. faded out and went back into yeah. history. Yeah. yeah, it's like whatever. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. So, like you just mentioned about carry optics, my thing is I want to make master in um, limited. I'm Bravo right now, B class. So master is the goal for me to make limited, but I also want to take a break from limited and venture into carry optics. But I'm still doing the research when it comes to carry optics, like far as looking for the firearm that I feel will complement me the most. Right now, my plan is to use the Q5 and get the red dot and make that happen. But as I stated, the uh, only thing I've ever done with an optic for a shooting is long range shooting. And when I was in the military with the ACOG and the EOTEX and the aim points. But that's one thing I do want to venture into. And I said probably next year because I'm going to try my hardest to move up this year um, within the limited division. So next year will be like a little break for me and then study, carry optics, and then come back to it. My only thing is I would think people who shoot with a red dot will get used to the red dot and then fade away from iron sights. And when I go back, it's like I'm moving backwards instead of moving forward. I, I, I definitely hear what you're saying there a hundred percent. Right. And there's a big concern where, cause I was an iron size guy 
for years. Um, started at Iron Sights and then got pushed to the Open because that was like the fun where everyone raced. When I started here in the U.S. all over again, I started Iron Sights again, same exact thing, established that baseline, the foundation, which you already have as well. And then got pushed into the Open game because that's where like everyone was. That's where the big boys were at. Let's ch chase that and you went overall, whatever. And then only 18 years later to basically go back to an Iron Sights, which is in limited I was very concerned how I would treat the iron sight world, but my duty carry for years in contracting world, I always shot before the RDS came out, it was always iron sights. And I know I could fairly run that well. The only thing was a transition learning how to constantly look at the target versus being somewhat sight focused with the iron sights, right? Depending on the target. And so once I did that, I switched over to 2018 or even before then switching to production, it wasn't as hard actually. And the biggest thing about that I noticed was I was able to capture not necessarily the best sight picture, but I was able to capture somewhat of a sight picture quicker than I did prior to in years before I actually ever started shooting behind a red dot. My eyes learned how to see faster because things in red dot was a lot more flowy and it's constant movement. All of a sudden I was given a iron sight all over again and I pick it up and I'm like man this is almost constantly like almost a perfect sight picture just a little, little high a little left but it doesn't seem like it's doing this like the red dot's constantly doing this and I gotta make a decision mm -hmm. when to pull it right and um so I felt like I, I I could see faster and process things faster so I feel like it made me a better iron sight shooter so with that said if you want to start transitioning you want to push yourself to limited high this year I would start setting up your Q5 as soon as you can and probably break up your practice like 80%, 20%. So 20% um, of your, let's say you go 100 rounds in practice, 100 rounds, would, 80 rounds would be limited and then go 20, 20, uh, 20 rounds of, iron, uh, of the red dot and learning how to transition your eyes. And that will only enhance your limited shooting for sure. Right. Yeah, and so it'll, you know, by next year, you're not completely switching. You've already started to make that transition. Make a transition. Through this yeah. year, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, I didn't, never thought about doing that, blending the two in like that. Yeah. That's, wow. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I learned I, that from Eric. Yeah, I like how that sounds. Yeah. Man. All right. So um, outside of that, does Beretta, are they going to venture into the carry optics world or have they already started that? Or are you going to be an intricate part in that? No, they've already started it way before right. I did. It was, that was always the goal. I mean, that's where you can see the trend is. This particular gun, they've already got a cut right here and they've already designed it. Uh, um, particularly, they're slightly different. There's a way, a couple ways to do it. They have T-nuts and all that stuff, right? So it's, uh, they don't have much meat here, as you can see right. on this particular thing. Um, so there's not much meat there, so they can't really dig deep down though. So, but uh, however, they can still mill it into the slide and the gun, um, the red dot sits on top of it. The best thing about this really is that the entire platform they did. Did all the work right here. It already reset as a pre-travel and then it breaks. So it's a pretty reset. So it's actually once you get the gun away from this double action phase, it goes into single action you technically have a 2011, 1911 style trigger. And that's what made me fall in love with this platform or with this company. Hmm. I knew the little way they did that trigger. The thing else I knew I could shoot around it as long as it was accurate and, and reliable. And not going it has been all of that and more than I've ever asked for. Nice. So they've already ventured it. And that's why I'm, I think my gun's already on the way. I got to start training up on it. I got to shoot it just last month. Trained a shot with it, um, shot a couple field courses with it, and I felt really, really good with it. Super excited to have it in my hand because, gosh, the new design, I think, is going to be super exciting to see where it's going to go. Right. So now, um, are we going to see commercials about the whole Beretta line coming out, whereas you and Jessica will be, like, on the forefront of that? Did somebody leak something to you? No, it's just a question that makes sense to me right now. Nobody said <laughs> nothing to me. <laughs> so, yeah, they did. And that's what I was able to shoot, the, the prototype guns, because mm -hmm. they wanted to film it. And obviously, give me a chance and opportunity to shoot. I'm going to try to train as a training session. So I decided to shoot as much as I could 
in the little time that I had when I was with them over there. And then they were filming, they were making us, they had our filming company to push these products and stuff like that. And then the cool thing about Beretta is that they're not only a gun company, they've been around for a very long time. They're like the yeah. single company that's been owned by one person the longest, right? Like one family, 500 mm. plus years or something like that. It's crazy. But um, what do you call that? Um, they have clothing and all that stuff, right? Like hats and shoes right. and shirts. And so it's been, and like I said, I've been so fortunate in locking in with us working with this company because it's it's been an amazing trip. But with the new guns and the new designs, yes, we did. Jessica and I were out there filming and we were testing the new prototype guns and we were doing... I think they're going to make it look good. I mean, this, this, anyone, right? If you just shoot right. normal, everyone's with the slow motion and their editing effect, they're going to make you look real good. So I think there's going to be some sort of promo reel when it comes out. <laughs> That's it right there. <laughs> that is it right there. That's what I thought. Someone leaked out something to you. I'm like, man, what's going on here? <laughs> no, no, I don't so much. Um, When people talk to me, I don't like to get in other people's business. Even if somebody was like, hey, let me tell you this. I'd be like, nope, don't want to know about it. You know, because of the fact I don't want to be held reliable if I was to say something and then yeah. I'm the bad guy for leaking something I wasn't supposed to know about you yeah. know so I, I kind of shy away from conversations like that when I do talk to people <laughs> you know so um are you still doing classes because you said you moved from Vegas to Florida so is that I'm um, going to affect anything with you giving classes or any projects with um partnership with classes with other instructors no, so it's the, which is the cool thing. The coolest thing right now is I can be anywhere. Um, so ever since leaving the government, we were so used to being anchored in one place, and you only you can only be there because of you know the needs of the agency, or whatever. And so ever since leaving the government in 2015, I'd had the ability to go wherever the hell I wanted, which is pretty neat. Right. Like some sort of freedom, which is really cool. Um, so now basically, I just need to be like within 20 minutes or 30 minutes up front away from the airport or whatsoever. And I can still teach. So yeah, I'm still teaching quite a bit. Last year was a really crazy year, obviously with COVID and all that stuff. We didn't know how to say no. We just kept on saying yes to everything. So I ended up, I think I counted <coughs> all together throughout the year. I believe I traveled over 170 days from June, not even counting before that, right? From June all the way to December. And it was it was a ridiculously amount, a uh, high amount of travel days and teaching. So I didn't get to shoot as much. I didn't get to train as much. And I, you know, I devoted myself to training. It was really nice to see how many messages I got and how much, uh, how far my students have progressed this year being that it's supposed to be the world championship year. My wife had decided that we're going to cut back severely um, and only probably teach about two to three classes a month, mm. um, which is still good. However, it's going to allow me a lot more time to develop myself and work and stay with the family and make up time for whatever loss. You know, even though you can't make up time, I do my best when I am home, I am home. Right. Because that was my next question was when you actually doing all these classes, because at one point in time, I was like, man, this guy's doing classes back to back. When does he practice and how is he staying relevant with shooting? You know, so like, how did you actually balance it out? Because on another scale, there was like at one point in time, I'll be on Instagram, it'll be like one, two o'clock in the morning on the East Coast, and you're doing dry fire, talking to people as you're doing dry fire, <laughs> you know? Yes. So, so that's, that's how I kept myself relevant and kept the dust off from growing and developing as quickly as it should have. Because at one point there last year, I literally went five weeks straight, five or six weeks straight prior to nationals. Straight, I went to New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and then I did that whole route all over again, like almost a circuit. Then went straight to North Carolina, and I was there for three weeks with the Army guys. And then, you know, and then I, I, I went out there in California for another week, and I think I came back, and then I went, and I was home for like two days, and I drove to Miami, just literally three days prior to nationals. So... So stuff like that. And that was how the year went, like back to back to back to back. All right. And it was home. I was home for me one day or a few hours and I had to fly again. And so stuff like that, when that happens, well, the way I do it is I just dry fire a ton. And, you know, a lot of times when I was doing that, I would share my dry fire sessions with a lot of the, my students or a lot of um, um, my followers. Right. So I would just dry fire and have a live session and then it would just come out and people would join me. 
And so that's what I did. And I just kept telling him, I would just constantly visualize and work on my mental game, one. And the second thing is I wanted to work on my, my ability to be able to point the gun since I'm learning a new gun. This is a very new gun that I'm, even though I've been shooting for a year with it, it's a new gun. It's a different gun compared to my Limcat. And so I have to learn it and all that stuff. So I was able to get up there. So by the time I did actually pull the trigger when I was t trying to train, it didn't feel as foreign to me. It felt like it was still an extension of my head. The only thing I had to get used to was learning the timing, the small nuances of the gun, understanding when to break the shot, when not to break the shot, how, how, how much prep trigger needed, how little can I get away with and how far my attack targets are and how close, you know, uh, how far I could shoot uh, an accurate shot on, on, a, on a control target and all these little things that, so I kept doing that and I didn't get the, performance that I wanted to, or the results I wanted to get at nationals. I wanted to win it, obviously, um, one for Beretta and two for just to, just to win it outright um, in open division. I ended up getting second, but I was happy by the way I shot for as little as I practiced. I was still able to manage second and actually had an opportunity to still win it near at the end there, except things just wasn't clicking as well as it should have. So I ended up falling short a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it happens to the best of us, but what they always say, there's always next time, right? But you're supposed to fail, right? And that's, man, that's, I'm telling you, that drives me nuts. Yeah. Drives me nuts. That's the best learning lesson also. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. <laughs> when you look at it from that perspective, at least that's yeah. what my dad used to always tell me, like failing is the yeah. best learning lesson. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. So um, how can the good people contact you, reach out to you? see your videos, anything you want to plug that you're doing, this is that time frame. Oh, right on. So you could, you could always hit me up on Instagram, JJ Rikaza. Um, just type that out and it should come up. I don't think I have a lot of fake followers or fake accounts out there. I'm not one of those guys. Mm -hmm. And then um, the other one, if people want to reach out for classes, just email my wife, jessica.rikaza at yahoo.com. And then I'm starting to do, I'm finishing up my YouTube video now where I, would, I break down my not a YouTube, I think, I don't know what it is, what platforms can be allowed, but I'm starting to break down my mental state, my approach, the way I dealt with a adversity in the match itself, and seeing how I was able to progress. And a lot of guys, I've been getting like hundreds of messages of people wanting to. I did like a little snippet of it on online, uh, on Instagram, and everyone was like, dude, you need to do that on a voiceover type, and you need to explain it a little bit more in detail, because that was so valuable. And I figured, I'm like, man, this is another way to give back to the community. If people think they can benefit from that, I'm definitely going to put it out. And uh, me and myself also, I thought back and I'm going, man, I wish I would, I would, I heard mental approach from Ravi, from Jerry Barnhart in, in regards to how they perform in a match, whether they won or lost. I kind of wanted to see that, see how they dealt with it and then follow that up with, in terms of practice and to continue to do that. So I will have some sort of, I don't know what to call it, a blog of some sort of running blog for all my matches that I'm going to be shooting. Um, and I'm going to start it with the nationals last year. Oh, okay. Well, that sounds pretty interesting. I want to check that out, you know. So, um, but like I said, other than that, I do want to thank you for coming on to the podcast. And of course, you know, like I said, you got a ton of followers, but everybody that's listening to the M-W Tactical Podcast, I'm pretty sure who, those who don't follow you, they will come on board and check out what all you have to offer. Because I want to say the co-host, Dave, the mad scientist, he actually did one of your challenges one time and he had told me he had beat you on one of the challenges, one of your reload challenges. So yeah. I think it was you put two shots on target, reload, reload and two shots. And it was like all had to be in the A zone. And yeah. he got you by like 0.2 seconds or something like that. Yeah. And yeah. when he had told me about it, of course, you know, I'm asking a lot of questions, breaking it down. And I was like, well, what was the one thing you did different? that you felt like captivated you. And he was saying like, when you do, when you do your reloads, you got a rhythm of you're bringing it down and everything is still in sync, but you're moving. And it's like, you're just doing that. But he stated what he did was when he would shoot, he just kept the firearm out there, put the magazine in, turned around. And that's how he felt he got that upper hand on you. Yeah, there's, there's different techniques, right? Be keeping it up here, keeping it down here. Mm -hmm. I would tell you this, says he's talking shit. <laughs> I'm going to post a video. I don't know when I can practice, maybe in two days. Mm -hmm. I'm going to post it out there. I'm going to call his ass out. I'm going to look up his time. I'm going to smoke that shit on the first try. 
<laughs> and I'm going to show him that my reload coming back down here, it doesn't matter. It's all technique, whether you keep it up or down. I've done it. I've done, I've done them both before. I'm mm -hmm. a lot more consistent when I bring it down because of limited when I started magazines before. When you put 18 rounds, it was really heavy to reload. So I'm so used to seating the gun and the mag all at the same time before I punch out. And so... I would always do that. And that became like a, essentially like a development process that I started to, and I just carry it on to from my limited production to open and all any gun that I shoot. But yeah, I can still reload being up here, but I'm a little slower. So I'd, I'd rather bring it down and meet and greet sooner, uh, all right. that stuff. But anyway, I'm gonna look up his time, <laughs> Dave. <laughs> I'm gonna get that shit right now. Sorry for my language. <laughs> this is me about to wreck your shit. <laughs> now, now, in Dave's defense, I will tell you that he has and his open gun is a Lemcat also. So he yeah. just went up getting a newer Lemcat version of it. Oh, and, good. Uh, that's that's a that's a big giveaway right there. <laughs> he has his right magwell. It's a rightly designed gun. <laughs> So of course, yeah. kudos to Limcat, not kudos to Dave for beating my time. <laughs> yeah, oh, actually, he just sent it back a few months ago. Actually, it was either last month or November. No, it had to be last month. So December, he actually sent it back to Limcat because um, he had stated, like, the grip was too small for his hands. So they had actually told him they was going to work with him, and they formulated something, and they're sending it. He sent it in. They're going to change it out and send it back to him. I'm going to tell you right now, that's one of the best things about Limcat. You can buy the gun from him. It's like mm -hmm. the sale after, of the service after the sale is pretty freaking awesome. Like, yeah. like, hey, man, I don't know. This gun's not working for me. The script's not working. I thought this is what I like. He'll freaking work with you and send it back and do whatever and give you huge discounts if not do it for free. Like, I've seen him do it for free for other guns that wasn't his. He was like, hey, I'll make it, I'll make it happen for you. I'm like, gosh, awesome. man. Yeah, such awesome. an awesome dude. Yeah, that's yeah. like I said, that's an awesome person that does stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. But then again, like I said, the shooting community is just that awesome all around. You're 100% you know right. Yeah. So, but once again, though, um, I do want to thank you for coming on to the podcast and um, thank you for sharing the knowledge and sharing your story. And anytime you would like to come on to the podcast again, like I said, just hit me up. You're welcome anytime you like. I probably appreciate it, Mike. Thank you very much, sir. Hey, no problem. So without further ado, please stay in your seats. Go follow JJ. And here are a few words from our sponsors. Are you in the market to purchase your first or next firearm, but find the atmosphere of a gun store intimidating, crowded, or uninviting? There's a way for you to purchase the gun you want while avoiding the crowds, the gruff salesmen, and the marked up prices that come with a brick and mortar gun store. The process is called a transfer, where the purchase is made in an online store and sent to a federally licensed middleman called an FFL, who processes the paperwork and background check for a firearm purchase. CAE Transfers is the FFL with the lowest transfer cost in the Midlands at only $20 or $15 with the presentation of a South Carolina concealed weapons permit and $10 for repeat customers. If you live in Columbia, South Carolina or its surrounding areas, choose CAE Transfers as your FFL during checkout and let me help you complete your online gun purchase. You can find and follow CAE Transfers online at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram using at CAE Transfers. Thank you for your business and I look forward to seeing you soon. Hey, this is Brian Conley at Hunters HD Gold. If you've never tried Hunters HD Gold, then I challenge you to find me at a match next year. Go to the website under scheduled events, find out where I'm going to be. Come meet me in person and demo a pair for yourself. Find out why shooters across the United States are changing to Hunters HD Gold to get 43% more light to their eyes, better contrast, eyes that are not fatigued at the end of the day based on the, the colors that we use, and find out the real meaning of why they change so you don't have to. So. Check us out on our website, huntershdgold.com, and I look forward to seeing you at the range soon. The Gun Cleaners. Our solvent is, I think, second to none. Our lube is second to none. Their lube's heavier than water, which is just a huge thing. People don't really put a lot of thought into that, just how huge that is to have on your gun, especially if you can still carry. The Gun Cleaners. Oh, yeah, most definitely. You know, you're going to sweat a lot of the other lubes off. With ours, it'll stay there. The Gun Cleaners. And maintaining the quality of the process, the quality of the end result, 
is another, and you guys are able to do both with the process that you have there. Order your supply of the lube and the solvent at www.theguncleaners.com. Thank you for taking the time to hang out with us on the M-W Tactical Podcast. Remember, a new podcast comes out every Tuesday. If you can't wait for Tuesday, go listen to past episodes to catch up on what you missed. Make sure you visit www.m-wtactical.com and see what all is offered on the site where you can even purchase M-W Tactical apparel. But please, go to our Facebook and Instagram page and follow us on our journey in the sport of competition shooting and the realm of the two-way community. Until next week, keep shooting, keep practicing, and have fun.